Okay, we're just going to give it a minute for attendees to populate and then we'll get started. Okay, well, uh, here we are, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I'm Chris Nunn. I'm Assistant Professor of Film at the University of Birmingham, and I'm Assistant Editor uh, for the Film Education Journal. And I'd like to welcome all of you to our Papers from the Film Education uh, Journal panel, um, uh, where we've got uh, three fabulous uh, uh, papers from uh, recent editions of our journal. Uh, that's the special edition on decolonizing the curriculum uh, that was published uh, late last year, and our most recent issue, which is out uh, this week. Um, so uh, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to do a bit of housekeeping before I hand over to some of our fabulous speakers uh, this afternoon. Uh, so for those of you, uh, there are captions uh, which are being provided on Zoom. Uh, they're also available on the link which has been uh, posted in the chat for you as well. So if you need captions, that's where they are. Uh, and uh, this is uh, being recorded, uh, as, I'm, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, so uh, the way we're going to run this is go to each of our speakers um, in turn, uh, roughly 10 to 15 minutes to, to talk through your uh, materials. Uh, and then uh, we'll try and facilitate uh, a discussion. Uh, I believe you uh, participants should be able to post questions in the chat. Um, and of course, I'll, uh, I'll probably be making some notes and have some questions myself as we uh, as we head to the end. Um, so uh, fabulous. Uh, in that case, can I go please uh, to our um, to our first speaker uh, this afternoon, Sarah Shamash, uh, who is uh, at uh, Emily Carr University of art and design. Sarah, can I pass to you? Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for inviting me to this conversation. Um, just bear with me as I share my screen. OK, so hopefully you all see a full screen. <laughs> We've got you. Um, thanks. So I'm joining you uh, today, this morning, <laughs> where I am from the uh, ancestral and unsurrendered lands of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations in what is colonially known as Vancouver. Um, and I'm going to be sharing some ideas from my paper, A Decolonizing Approach to Genre Cinema Studies, with a focus on Latin America and more specifically Brazilian cinema. Um, and from this slide, uh, you know, it presents posters from three contemporary Brazilian feature films, uh, Bacurau, In the Heart of the World, and Invisible Life, which all came out in 2019. And I'm interested in these films uh, as a scholar in terms of uh, what they're communicating about a particular moment in Brazilian history. Uh, but I was also thinking about what it meant to teach these films um, in a North American context and what the extra labor uh, is needed to properly contextualize this work to North American university students. Um, so my paper focuses on the decolonial possibilities of teaching genre cinema through non-Western um, and Global South um, and what I call pluriversal perspectives, which I'll further unpack. And I use the practice of film analysis as a critical pedagogical tool to do some of this labor. And in this talk, I extend some of the ideas I introduced in my paper. Um, and for the sake of time, I just will be briefly discussing uh, one film to highlight uh, analysis as a pedagogical tool. Um, so just to situate myself in this conversation, I was born to an ethnically Middle Eastern father who grew up in Brazil and an American and French mother who grew up between the US and France. And I was born in a household where I learned Portu and spoke Portuguese, uh, French, and ad eventually adopted English as my dominant language. 
Um, and I really invite the knowledges of students who bring in their multiple languages and cultures and histories and geographies into our classroom discussions on film. And as a mixed person who grew up in an intercultural, uh, multi-ethnic, multilingual household with one foot in Brazil and one in Canada, um, my understanding of what it means to be between worlds and the knowledges that exist from the multiplicity of co coexisting worlds uh, the pluriverse has become a useful framework for me to unpack cinematic worlds. Um, and the conceptualization of this coexistence of multiple worlds and worldings and against a one world order has developed from land based economies and revolutionary social movements, peoples and groups existing outside academia and the capitalist system. Um, and while many alternative models exist, uh, the Zapatistas are a notable revolutionary group who articulated un mundo donde quepan todos los mundos, or a world into which all worlds fit. And this idea of a world of many worlds is relevant to cinema uh, studies, as cinema is essentially a reworlding form that has the power to critically examine the world and imagine the possibility of different reels. So just as communities of resistance are imagining different ways of life, so too are filmmakers who propose resistance to neoliberal extractive models uh, and envision other worlds where coexistence with the planet is possible. Um, and I use the term global south and non-western to uh, signify epistemological and ontological locations and perspectives that transcend geospatial borders. Um, as articulated by Moyo uh, in his monograph, um, the global south invokes, um, and I'm quoting Moyo here, uh, a new cartography of epistemic and cultural resistance against global capitalism and Western media monopolies. Um, so understanding cinematic practices uh, from a global south and non-Western framework thus decenters Euro-Western supremacy by leveling hierarchies within a pluriversal perspective that recognizes coexisting multiple worlds and worldings. Um, and I use this term pluriversal as theorized by Latin American decolonial thinkers, uh, such as Arturo Escobar. Um, and I make this direct connection with pluriversality to better understand global South film practices as acts of resistance to the one world order and to recognize a diversity of ways of relating to and being in the world. Um, as well as a diversity of ways of making films. Um, so in my text for the Film Education Journal, I focused a part of my discussion on these three Brazilian films that I taught as part of a course on genre cinema studies um, at the University of British Columbia. Um, you really can't get a more colonial name than that. And uh, the University of British Columbia sits on Musqueam land. And I often ask students to do uh, an experiential land acknowledgement. Um, and this can be a means to open the possibilities of thinking cinematic grammars from other axes. So students uh, went on Musqueam territory and uh, asked the land for a small gift, such as a rock um, that we would keep with us throughout the term before returning it back to the land. Uh, as a way to anchor ourselves in thinking about the land as teacher. And many of the films I teach think about land struggles and histories of colonization. So this experiential exercise was an opportunity for reflection on what it means to be learning in a university that sits on stolen indigenous land, uh, as well as thinking about cinematic universes that consider the teachings of the land as part of their grammar. So that was a bit of a digression to acknowledge that cinema studies are not universal. Uh, cinema is a pluriverse. And in my text, I make a case for filmic analysis as a pedagogical tool to ground these films in specific social, cultural, geopolitical contexts. Um, you know, in the case of these films, namely in Brazil during a particularly repressive political era. Uh, and I do the labor of situating these films within a Latin American Brazilian national film context. Um, and we can draw connections between filmic and extra filmic texts, all within a cinematic language that potentializes a critical vision of contemporary Brazil 
during what Karim A. News, uh, the director of the film Invisible Life, appropriately called, um, and I'm quoting him, uh, Operation Condor 2.0 in a post-screening discussion of his film uh, at the Lincoln Film Center in New York. Uh, so, you know, the original Operation Condor was a cross-border systemic and sinister campaign of terror by the United States uh, to bring order into her backyard, um, i.e. Latin America, under the banner of anti-communism after the Cold War, with the goal of implementing a neoliberal order that would serve U.S. economic interests. So this progressive move started in the late 60s, uh, although the Trans-American Network was formally institutionalized in 1975 and codenamed Operation Condor. Um, so although this repression we witnessed in Brazil under Bolsonaro, under Bolsonaro was not homogeneous across Latin America, uh, under Trump and uh, many of his predecessors, we witnessed a rise in the U.S. Uh, supporting authoritarian governments that served U.S. economic interests. And uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to briefly discuss Bakurao as exemplar of how a discussion of genre cinema can open conversations on political resistance and consciousness. Um, so the role of setting uh, and genre reign supreme in Bakurao. Uh, we're definitely not in Hollywood uh, or in Kansas anymore. Um, we're in Bakurao which is the speculative place deep in the heart of Brazil's uh, Northeast or Brazil's World West, where there are different rules, uh, cosmologies, histories, realities, as well as cinematic frameworks. And unlike the hegemonic cultural structure of Hollywood cinema that first codified categories of films into genres, the intentional heterodox adoption of genre, its hybridization, imbue the genrefication of Bacurau with the Brazilian anthropophagic strategy uh, similar to Tropicalia, Tropicalia's synth syncretic lineage. Uh, so the opening of Bacurau starts with Caetano Veloso's 69 composition of his song uh, Não Identificado or Unidentified uh, performed by Gal Costa both these musical giants of Tropicalia, and the camera moves over this black screen to these Tropicalia sounds uh, from outer space to planet Earth in a sci-fi framing with a camera move that slowly zooms into Brazil's no Northeast. Um, so Veloso, uh, one of the biggest proponents of Tropicalia, was uh, incidentally arrested with Roberto Gil in 1969 as the U.S.-backed dictatorship viewed uh, Veloso and Gil's music and political action as uh, threatening. So while the U.S. westerns of uh, classical the classical Hollywood cinema period served as an origin story for settler colonialism, uh, painting white men as heroes and indigenous people as savages in need of being civilized, uh, Bakurao uh, subverts this trope uh, when the gun crazed uh, supremacists, white supremacists come to Bakurao to shoot its population for sport. So there are no white male heroes uh, in this film. Um, and Bakurao provides a futuristic uh, utopia of its potential as a place for a socially progressive, diverse, and technologically advanced uh, community to band together against the powerful forces of colonial capitalism uh, or under Operation Condor 2.0. Uh, so under, uh, you know, the matriarchy of the uh, deceased Dona Carmelita, an Afro-Brazilian woman, uh, white supremacy, foreign invasion, and predatory colonizers have no place in this speculative town in a very real uh, Brazil. Uh, and Mendoza Filho, uh, has ex one of the directors of the film, has explained in an interview that, and I'm quoting, the unstated but absolutely crucial idea for our film was that Bakurao is a type of remixed quilombo. Um, so I call up the Quilombo dos Palmares, which was the largest area of slave uh, resistance, uh, a refuge of quilombolas or escaped slaves, mostly from Bahia and Pernambuco's sugarcane farms and mills. Uh, that lasted for almost a century in colonial Brazil. 
And this idea of the remix can be read as a kind of cinematic worlding or aesthetic that at uh, once uh, critiques the status quo while offering another possible. Uh, so here the remix Kilombu is a utopian space uh, where this intergenerational grouping of people, uh, sex workers, teachers, doctors, outlaws, DJs, uh, children, queer, transgender, and non-normative bodies from these diverse ethnic and racialized backgrounds come together as community to resist uh, white supremacy, political impunity, and foreign invasion. Uh, so genre becomes a rupture uh, with stereotyping and narrative conventions, and the film intentionally uh, is genre bending, uh, you know, while drawing from the Western to the thriller to science fiction. Um, so, um, you know, I spent a bit of time discussing, uh, you know, one film because I see film itself as a teacher and the exercise of film analysis using uh, the global south as an analytical framework, uh, I view as a portal to knowledge about the world from non-Western perspectives. So these expressive acts of cinematic freedom in my discussion of Brazilian cinema examine and expose the colonial legacy of foreign invasion uh, and how it persists in a techno-colonial surveillance capitalist context. So genre is adopted, uh, subverted, and explored here as a means to access wider circuits of distribution while promoting radical political imaginations of the global South, uh, of our critical global struggles for climate justice, social equality, and liberation from systems of oppression, and teaching these aesthetics and histories, languages, and geographies, um, you know, can and should be uh, well informed, but also uh, a liberatory process, you know, following Bell Hooks's critical pedagogy that connects with our students' worlds, you know, with their queries uh, and struggles and lived experiences. Um, and, you know, in my text, I kind of conclude with stating that teaching these films is also uh, a source of joy, uh, you know, for me um, in celebrating the incredible cinematic wealth of Brazilian and Latin American cinema. Um, thank you. Yeah. Wonderful, Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh... I haven't stopped scribbling notes uh, throughout all of that. So some really interesting stuff for uh, discussion there. Thank you uh, very much. Um, and to time as well. Uh, so it's all happening. Thank you. Um, great. I'm going to move on to our, uh, our next uh, paper. Uh, so we have two presenters here, uh, Cleona Mayer and uh, Armida de la Gaza. Uh, from uh, University College Cork. If I can hand over to you, please. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for the invite as well to be part of this conversation. Um, it's great to be here. My name's um, Cleana, and I work at University College Cork in Ireland. I am the International Officer for Latin America and the Caribbean. So I work in internationalization of higher education. And I'm here to, um, with my colleague, Armida. Yes, hi everybody. Uh, really happy to be here too. My name is Armida de la Garza. I am originally from Mexico, but I've been uh, working in Ireland for 10 years now. Lina and I work closely together. I am associate professor, well, senior lecturer in uh, digital arts and humanities and screen media. So I, um, so we, we um, wrote the paper together. So I've just shared my screen there. I hope you can see it okay. So um, the paper we wrote together is Decolonizing the Film Studies Curriculum Through South-North Collaborative Online International Learning, also known, known as COIL. Um, so our session will um, explain what is virtual exchange or collaborative online international learning and how, um, how this tool can help to decolonize the film studies curriculum. So first of all, what is virtual exchange or COIL? Um, it's, it became obviously very popular um, during the pandemic. Um, you know, very people, I think one of, the, one of the pioneers in COIL, John Rubin in, in New York said um, to, it, that it was it was quite funny that the pharmaceutical industry and coil were probably the two most successful 
businesses during the pandemic. Um, but anyway, COIL is, I mean, it did exist before the pandemic, but obviously everybody, you know, was scrambling to find tools to work completely online um, at that time. So it's an approach to teaching and learning that connects students and teachers from different locations by allowing them to collaborate on tasks or projects remotely without the need to move physically. It can be fully online or hybrid. And the curriculum may or may not be identical, but it can be complementary, with only the shared units and assignments being similar or identical, as agreed by the faculty involved. So one great example um, that explains it well was I saw an engineering class in Veracruz in Mexico um, collaborate with an, with a, an English language class in New York. So the task, the Mexican students um, you know, that they were, they were receiving credits for was to explain their final year enge engineering product projects in English and have a good presentation, you know, to, to explain it with. And the language students in New York, you know, were, were perfecting their scientific or engineering English. So, you know, they worked together on a similar mission, um, but very different programs and, and you know, and, and, and very different um, realities. But the COIL approach considers participatory learning as ideal for students to discover ways of being global citizens, since new media foster a sense of shared belonging and are naturally collaborative. You know, so students not only have to walk, you know, work with um, students in different languages, but in you know different cultures across different time zones, um, you know, and different cultures with technology. Um, what's quite notable is that it, during the pandemic in 2020, four key universities in Latin America, including our partner Universidad Veracruzana, together with Universidad de Monterrey in Mexico, um, a university, te the Tecnológico in Medellín, Colombia, and UNESPI in Brazil, founded the Latin American Network for COIL, which to date um, has 135 member universities and they have students, um, many from indigenous backgrounds who are already actively engaging in decolonizing, decolonizing curriculum, not only within the region, but you know, globally. Um, so how does it work? The North-South collaboration, it frequently reproduces colonization relationships in various ways by fostering brain drain and by subordinating the relationship to the needs and interests of the North. COIL avoids this. So COIL really facilitates connections between the Global South and North by providing a more equal basis for interaction. Resources are shared and there's no, no need for um, you know, the terrible travel visas that, that exist when collaborating. Um, difficulties in the South in attracting recruiting staff from abroad are used and the legal frameworks that in some cases constrain cooperation are bypassed. Um, its grassroots origins were was from academics who who started to collaborate independently of and sometimes even against the you know the bureaucratic structures of our universities. John Rubin, one of the the pioneering founders, described Coil as used the metaphor of of pirate ships um, collaborating together. Um, I mean, even we, we, we've we've done a lot of coils with you know with Latin America who in some way are streets ahead of us in Europe, you know, using these tools. Um, and, you know, it, it's very hard to get recognition for our own students within our structures, um, you know, for, for the work they've done. But we've had really positive feedback um, that it has enriched, you know, their learning. I'll pass over to Armida. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Glenda. Yes, so now uh, thinking about these features of COIL then, of virtual exchange, as it is also known, we were thinking of how this could then be applied to the film studies curriculum. So how could this tool be used to help us decolonize the film studies curriculum? And this is the second part of the article, and this is what I am going to go into now. If you could please uh, go to the next slide, Glenda. So uh, the first thing to say is that uh, we, we would like, we, we envisaged this as building on the tradition, the radical tradition of Latin American cinema. So frequently Latin American cinema is 
left there as part of world cinema, as, as a, uh, one of the of the sessions on uh, world so-called world cinema. And uh, the session tends to be about all this, which is uh, what originated in Latin America that you may be familiar with, this idea of imperfect cinema that cinema with um, with the perhaps a budget that was uh, not uh, comparable to the first world or the second world, uh, but still was able to tell engaging stories that attracted the audience, that made their minds engage, was preferable. This was the, the time of the, the 1960s and 70s when we had all these movements about cinema that came from Latin America, from places like Cuba, like Brazil. These kind of movements so uh, such as this one such as the, um, the that we also heard from the previous speaker already and um, it comes even today when you can hear that there are films that are made uh, with a director in this case from Mexico Children of Men that um, instead of telling the stories in the usual way where there's a hero for the audience to identify with, and even if this is a very well-meaning film, let's say about a migration, but the, the strategy to tell it is not uh, by making the, the is not by helping the viewer identify with this hero that can do everything, but rather it's a story of this empowerment. So in fact, the viewer suffers along with the protagonist, this coming down that ensues from his being um, a mistaken for a migrant. And that is that is um, that produces in the viewer this, this quiet. So this sensation that something is not quite right. So the point is that even in the way of telling the stories, there is still this kind of radical tradition that we can see from that time up to today. So that was, that was the first point we wanted to make, that we see Latin America as a particularly good uh, Latin American cinema background for this kind of engagement uh, in, in decolonization of film studies, given its rich tradition. And then we can move on to the next uh, slide. And uh, so this is where we begin to focus on the on the features of COIL that make it ideal for decolonizing the curriculum in film studies. The first one is this part that it's collaborative. So because of the collaborative nature, there is reciprocity involved there. There's this project that in order to be done, there has to be this cooperation. So it's an alternative to the extractive relationship between North and South that has characterized colonialism and neocolonialism. So thinking of collaboration and bringing this to the context of cinema, of film, we thought immediately of co-productions. Co-productions would make an excellent theme for students to do in a COIL course because they provide a positive model for international cooperation as they strike a balance between international collaboration and various national interests. They are also good in that they enhance budgets and they, there is this wider distribution that comes from having many partners involved. Um, so they increase the outreach. And this is why creating um, a cultural, they, they create cultural screen encounters between people in different nations. Um, and then the, because we, you have to negotiate the syllabus, there is a scope to take into consideration students' preferences uh, so that you can co-create this actually together. So this is why there is also the, the possibility of uh, including the students as partners framework. So that's the first point we have collaboration of, or the first feature of COIL that we thought we can bring. Then there's the next slide. There's the second feature, which is online. So digitization has extended and broadened the learning environment already in the form of the repositories that we now have. Now we post files, there's the streaming that we can do today. We can embed films, there is video annotating and so on. So this has already helped a lot, helped our teaching a lot. But there's more here. There's, for instance, in interviews, many times students report that they feel there is an equalizing effect 
when they do COIL courses because they are online. And so uh, they, you know, they can turn off their camera, for example. They don't have to be this embodied person that they are. And they find that liberating in, in some respects. So that was the first interesting point that we thought we should raise. Another point is that the use of technology to tell stories about other people, about, uh, for instance, about indigenous populations, um, it allows us to decenter these Eurocentric accounts of history that are usually told in such a way that we started, with, uh, you know, people in the caves, and then through the Enlightenment, we finally arrived to the point where we are today, that is the pinnacle, that is basically um, Europe or the Western world. So this Eurocentric uh, account of history can be challenged in this way by using technology to tell all these other stories. And so we thought an ideal coil for this could be that students reflect on the impact of digital distribution and exhibition of Latin American films online on platforms such as Cine Aparte or Retina Latina and uh, that they could even participate with jointly produced outputs, for instance, for uh, Retina Latina's online festival. This online festival entitled uh, El Cine Que Resiste, so Films That Resist, has the aim to distribute digital films about social justice, about memory and resistance made by young filmmakers from the region. So we thought one task could be if students of translation could work with film students um, to subtitle a sample of films on decolonization. And this could be curated by the students and screen them on the uh, university in the north, on, on the partner universities. So we've, we've done collaborative, we've done online, and we have the last one, Kleena, please, the last feature. of COIL that is international, collaborative online international learning. And here we have this, uh, there's a, a, an extra N there, but the hyphen, uh, because the bottom line for both physical mobility and virtual exchange is that improved competences result from meaningful interactions in diverse groups, both online and offline. So indigenous peoples must be included uh, in, in these diverse groups as nations in the term international, uh, even because they are actually nations, even if they lack a state precisely due to colonization. So uh, we thought that a coil with indigenous partners could center on documentary, which is a very good model for political activism. And the sample content could be a history of documentary, could be a critical appreciation of documentaries on current issues of mining, deforestation, and the general exploitation of natural resources in Latin America that acutely affect indigenous peoples and actually the world. And that this would coincide with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or a hands-on approach with students making their own short documentaries. So perhaps on a topic such as education from an indigenous perspective, from indigenous traditions. So this is why we thought that, that these features of COIL um, can really be useful to implement this kind of, um, of curriculum uh, to, to help decolonize film studies. And that's it, it really. So the last slide is basically the conclusion. And we have argued that the features of COIL, namely collaboration, online delivery, and international scope, make it an ideal means to decolonize the curriculum in film studies when working in South-North partnerships with Latin American higher education institutions. And we hope as many colleagues as possible, we take up the challenge because it's actually a challenge. We didn't dwell on the, on the um, disadvantages or the problems uh, today, but it's not that easy to implement uh, these coils, uh, it has to be said. And finally, just to thank everyone for being here today. And if there are any questions, of course, we are happy to take them. Thank you.
Oh, thank you very much. Uh, both of you scribbling notes on on how I can uh, how I can start a coil. This sounds like fun. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited, <laughs> excited by the prospects of this. Not sure how excited my university will be by the prospects of this, but uh, I'll uh, I'll let you know uh, in in due course. Uh, finally, fabulous. Thank you so much uh, to our uh, our final speaker, uh, Ronnie Hardlis from uh, the University of Gothenburg. Ronnie, if you'd like to take it away, please. Thank you, Chris. Um, I will. Um... Uh, say a few words and uh, uh, thank you also to the previous um, presenters, Sarah, um, Cleona and uh, Armida. I'm really excited to, to have a discussion after that. It's, it's fascinating proposals. And I'll, I'm coming maybe more from a practice-based um, perspective. I will say something about um, the article and how it relates to film education. Um, how my own uh, artistic practice relates to the questions that are raised in the article, and then how um, I'm trying to bring my own research um, in relation to the educational framework and, and some conclusions. And in between, I'm going to try to screen some of the films that I have produced or uh, that have been come out of teaching. So um, the, the um, article is uh, entitled with a, with a question, how do we look at animals? Um, it's uh, about uh, animal-human relationships, about the, the colonized relationship and how the possibilities of decolonization. Um, the um, uh, indigenous uh, poet and, and researcher Billy, uh, Ray Belcourt has pointed to the fact that um, animals are um, important in thinking decoloniality because they are being framed or, or, or centered as um, or, or being made intelligible as um, part of a um, settler um, imaginary through in particular architectural spaces like slaughterhouses and farms, but also through uh, imaginaries like the wild forest. So, so um, there's a particular colonizing framing of animals. And when we talk about uh, land repartition, for example, that becomes uh, an important issue. Um, the looking at observation um, with or through the camera makes the link through um, documentary film practice. So it's, um, um, I'm trying to point to the fact that um, going somewhere with the camera is per se a kind of intrusive practice and that the decolonial questions that we ask to the relationship with animals, in particular, the question, how can we document or make a documental work about or with animals, um, concerns the documentary practice as such. We need to rethink that in decolonial terms. So the um, article um, is um, uh, really about um, the, the film-related research, uh, um, my own research project, and how that can be brought into education. And um, the title of the research is uh, D-Doc Donkey Work, um, Decolonizing Documentary Art Practices and the Global Crisis for Donkeys. Um, I will come back to that issue later. I just want to point to a first complication because um, I'm uh, addressing uh, an educational aspect, um, which is the um, epistemic crisis of documentary practices. So traditionally in the institutions, um, uh, a particular documentary practice is being treated, still being treated as kind of like a sub um, practice of a greater media um, related um, teaching and study form. So film, if you want to study a documentary film practice, you have to go to the film institute and um, it's, it's treated as a genre of film. Um, then you have another department which has photography and documentary photography. You have the same in theater, in, in literature, and so on. So um, we have failed in, in creating um, uh, uh, a space in which documental questions and concerns and methods can be discussed and treated and studied independent from media. 
Um, and so this is like one of the main concerns and film practice or film studies are um, like the bad guy in the room in a way, in, in, in as much as they capture the whole um, discourse on documentary practices. So the complication is a bit that I work with film. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in documental questions as a, um, a media independent field, but um, I, I explore it through film. But I do it as an art practitioner. I'm, I'm actually someone who works with the camera. And I think that art practice has a particular potential there to um, contribute because it has been dealing with the dissolution of medias for um, over 100 years. So nowadays, it's not so much that you're a painter or a sculptor, but you're a visual artist. And you do something through painting or through sculpture or through whatever seems most appropriate for what you want to do or where you feel most at ease doing that. Um, the second aspect, education aspect that I'm addressing in the paper is um, a, a more concrete example of how I bring the, the research um, into education um, in an um, intensive course in the master film at H HDK Valand at uh, um, the University of Gothenburg and how that allows for the development of new um, apparatuses of image production. So um, I'm now going to share the screen. So um, as someone who makes films, I can call myself a filmmaker, but as I said, um, these films are a result of my work um, and interaction with the camera. Uh, when I did my PhD uh, at Middlesex University in London, I, I realized that actually all my previous work, which was kind of like a transdisciplinary work between art and architecture already um, included the the interaction with the camera so i was filming my work documenting my work constantly but it's um actually impossible to say what or where the artwork is like in this example uh, a film in uh, or a work produced in rome the final product in a way is a mosaic that we put up uh, with um these ceramic shards that we found in, in, in the sea. Um, but it's also, it's also the performance of doing that. And it's also the film that um, captures it. In this case, it's being filmed with um, one of the first uh, pocket cameras that was able to um, produce video clips of uh, the length of five seconds each. That was the maximum length. So the final film is actually just uh, an addition of these clips documenting the progress, but it's in itself um, the work as well. I just quickly scroll to the end so you can see what that looked like. Um, from this emerged works that put the relation um, between the camera and its context at the center, um, the context being myself in this case, or other protagonists or architectural spaces. Um, so here, um, I'm, I'm trying to um, kind of create a critical relationship with the caves, um, prehistoric um, cave paintings in, in Lascaux. Um, but the camera is turning and um, kind of unhinging gravity. Um, so I, I need to find a way uh, how I can deal with this um, movement camera. But the um, particular use of the camera that cannot be put in uh, some of the main historical categories um, that um, traditionally are being referred to in, in the Western context, such as um, it, it does not, um, the camera does not try to make us see something that we couldn't see with our eyes, like in Zygovetov's uh, camera glass, 
um, or it doesn't um, try to build an argument through images like the um, uh, pen in essay writing, like the camera stilo. Um, it's not a fly in the room like in direct cinema. It's um, in some way related to um, Dogma 95 manifesto films, I think, where um, um, a certain kind of a set of rules is being set up to um, uh, along which then the the filming is being made, or um, maybe the most uh, the closest um, reference might be Michael Snow, um, who yeah, in a way it's also is it the filmmaker really, but the, it's also someone who worked with the camera and uh, tried to to produce works that had film as one of its components. So while the camera um, may be animated by something that is disconnected from the real context, it nevertheless functions as a kind of conductor of um, the images that um, in this context are being produced. So I like to think of it as some kind of um, uh, resonation that um, takes place between the camera and the context, and that that can be um, translated to the to the viewer. And in collaborative um, situations, that would be uh, something that has to be dealt with together. So I just go to another film here. The research project, the Doc Donkey Work, um, is concerned with uh, the global crisis for donkeys. Um, just briefly, the context of this is that um, um, there is a um, traditional Chinese medicine being produced from the donkey skin. And the, um, uh, due to um, really propaganda of this uh, medicine and it's kind of like modern hype, um, uh, the resources are just not enough in China. They have already halved their population, donkey population, and they're resourcing the donkeys now in the global south, mainly in Africa, um, threatening the local um, economies because it's it's quite fascinating that um, the donkey that has a, a value as the animal of uh, of labor and burden. Um, now is being um, uh, kind of perceived with a completely different value. The Chinese buy the donkey, or there's also a lot of illegal trade, so they get stolen, not for the, to use the donkey for work, but actually to use the skin. So there's a huge conflict um, emerging from that um, global uh, network of production and exploitation. And that's the case study on which I try to, to think and explore new ways of relating to animals through um, documentary practice. I'm trying to bring that into education on a, a methodological level. So exploring methods of uh, decolonizing documentary practices, but also methods of decolonizing film educational practices. Um, in the paper itself, um, I talk about that under the title Postcards from the Future. Um, it's um, what what we did or how, how it's structured in, in at Gothenburg University is um, that we work with intensive weeks, with intensive tasks. And the students are being given the task to um, uh, in a precisely formulated brief. Um, that is more or less structured like a research proposal. In that case, they had to choose an animal. They didn't have to work with a donkey, but they had to choose an animal and conceive of um, what we call the animated camera or a form of animated camera with the means they had at their disposal. They also got some um, film and text references and um, two or three weeks to produce the work. Um, then in the actual intensive week, there were presentations and, and feedback systems, 
shared screening experiences, tech seminars, um, and followed by um, a task that we asked them to do overnight, which was sending a postcard uh, from the future. So I have to do um, credit um, Jyoti Mystery for the idea of the postcard, but I combined it with the um, ideas that are, for example, present in uh, Afrofuturism. So the future here is not talking about the future, but trying to take a position in the future and talk back to, to the present situation. So that future could also be, for example, um, uh, uh, another planet, the Mars, or in, in this case, it could also be an, an animal that you choose as a position to speak from. So um, that kind of um, disruption in the teaching uh, allowed the students to shift their own um, position together with the feedbacks that they got and rework their um, uh, films in, in as, as the rework task. And it allowed the students to um, make a big leap in their uh, in leaving preconceived opinions. Interestingly, the choices that the students made were uh, quite diverse. Um, I would just just um, shortly touch on that. They um, someone chose a particular context that allowed um, to use a, a specific aesthetic rule for filming in a natural history museum. Another student um, animated the camera by attaching it to uh, an animal. Um, interesting way of being with uh, another um, being. Um, once you work, they found footage and found sound. Um, and um, once you also work with uh, what I called radical post-production, so completely going through a new kind of a documentary film process uh, through editing. Okay, so now I didn't have um, access now to the films that were produced then. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm showing here a film that has been done in another intensive, but um, it's a similar outcome. So uh, I just let that round in the background while I say something about um, uh, some conclusive words. Theoretically, this work um, refers to uh, Gayatri Chakravorty's Spivak's analysis of Derrida and the call to the quite other in us, which I ad identify as an originality that is uh, the stake of animals. As related to such quite otherness, the apparatuses of image production the students invented were all turning against themselves. They were all quite other than just cameras. There were apparatuses resonating with reality and transmitting functional images, not like opening a window, just allowing us to see and interact by ourselves. In terms of teaching, my task was to bear with the students' struggles, providing ourselves with information, spaces for discussing theoretical references, and uh, for generating shared cinema experiences. <laughs> In such um, collaborative or research-based education, the student-teacher collective is set in relation to the educational object, the transmission of knowledge um, from teacher to student is questions from the start and methodologically applied in non-intrusive feedback models among the students themselves. Similarly, the Animal Filmmaker Collective, um, by knowing that the animal is um, witnessing unknows ways of making animals intelligible by inserting them into the colonizing spaces of documentary film.
So this is it. And I'll stop sharing. Fabulous. Thanks so much, Ronnie. Uh, an awful lot uh, to digest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, I've, I've got a load of notes I'm not sure I can read them uh, I was reading incidentally a book review this morning on a new book about Henry David Thoreau um, and there was an anecdote uh, that they pulled out of the book uh, about a farmer one of Thoreau's neighbours who watched him as he stood motionless for an entire day watching frogs in a pond mm. I wonder if, yeah, <laughs> no, so somehow that anecdote came back to me when uh, when I was looking at your presentation and thinking about uh, the things we're not seeing. I think William James called it a certain blindness in human beings. Uh, so I think that's absolutely fascinating. And I, uh, really, all, all three case studies here, uh, there's a really nice anarchist inflection here, right? That we're not we're not quite doing it right. I mean, we've had Zapatistas, we've had pirates. I mean, I know you're not really pirates if you're doing a coil, but there is a sense in which, you know, sort of collaborative uh, networks of of, uh, of international people might come together and produce something. Uh, and last but certainly not least, of course, uh, you know, things that we're not not watching, things that we're not sure about. And I, I suppose for me, it 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 almost feels like a lot of our terminologies, the way we you know, again, uh, Ronnie, you sort of talked about documentary as a, as a colonizing force in and of itself, because it's codified, because it has rules, it has structures, the very way we teach it. I've just started working this year on a master's that focuses quite intently on documentary. So I've become aware of that for the first time, really, about how, how we kind of codify these things. It feels like we need probably new, new terms, for the work that we're the work that we're doing, the work that our students are doing, uh, and I wonder if our panelists have any thoughts on that. I mean, like one of them is I've always struggled to think. Okay, so you're you want to run a film or filmmaking degree, but you also are aware that that term in many ways is outmoded, outdated, and comes with a load of baggage. Uh, not least is kind of industrial codes and conventions, which I think all of you have have kind of touched on here. So I wonder what those new terms or, or, or you know, might be. Uh, again, uh, I, I'm reminded of that sort of Foucault, as soon as you name it, well, you've you've kind of screwed yourself over because you've named it and you've created a, a thing and then you have to adhere to the thing. So maybe it's about not naming. Uh, and I'm not sure how much sense I'm making at this point, but I wonder if I've provoked any thoughts in you guys. Are we, are we what are we moving towards as film educators? In terms of how we structure uh, and, and how we bring our our our, our students together uh, again on courses and within within uh, frameworks that can sometimes be very problematic in and of themselves. Uh, and just before I allow you to answer, uh, a reminder to our fabulous uh, uh, participants, please questions in the chat. If you'd like to ask your question live, I believe we can put you on camera. I'm sort of throwing that one out into the air because I'm not sure I can do it myself. But uh, anyway, over to our panelists, uh, some, some some responses to my thoughts on on how we're how we're codifying or how we should not be codifying what we what we do. Yeah, maybe I can I can say that I can very much relate to to the kind of negative formulation, um, which I also used at the end of, of my my conclusion, um, just being aware of um, the documentary film as um, a colonial space in which the animal can be included. And through that awareness of avoiding um, situations where that could happen, um, it's a starting point. Um, and it might not even be necessary, you know, to, to, to be able to name what is the right way of doing it as a start. And um, the, 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 the last film I, I showed was actually um, a similar um, intensive, but focusing on the notion of play. Also kind of um, uh, an attempt also of liberating, you know, um, uh, oneself of, of 
um, too much restriction and, and drawing on something that is, um, Brian, Brian Masumi talks about that um, because um, it's fascinating that, uh, for example, dogs are able to discern between a playful and uh, a real fight situation. So there is some um, cognitive um, distinction at play that um, the animal can, can, can perform. But at the same time, in the play, you give yourself totally over to, into the playful mode and this is something we we try to to explore in in a positive way you know so that it it's it shouldn't be blocking and i think um the 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 coil project is is really interesting in as much as it's also trying to do a similar thing and and name some um you know the 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 online uh the, the the positive aspect of the online, uh, the liberating you said aspect of the online format. So I thought that was really interesting. Great, thank you. Any other thoughts from our? Um, yeah, interesting thinking about uh, documentary and genre and these different histories. Um, uh, but you know, certainly documentary and uh, Armida and Cleona brought this up. You know these like revolutionary social movements in Latin America, you know, with third cinema and fourth cinema and imperfect cinema and imperfect video, uh, which has been used to talk about indigenous uh, film and media practices. Um, so, you know, I think those tools have been appropriated by these other subjectivities uh, to, um, Again, yeah, we do need different film languages, I think, to talk about those works, uh, you know, that aren't just framed in these, I mean, so much of film theory has been, you know, codified in Euro Western centrism. So we do need to ha have other languages to talk about those, those works. And uh, the, the filmmakers are decolonizing it. They are using those tools and making documentaries uh, from these other perspectives. Um, so, um, yeah, so anyway, I'll turn it over to uh, Armin and Duna to... Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, you might be muted there, Armida. Yes. Yes, these, uh, these steps actually are what's needed, I would say, like uh, this special issue precisely. Um, how can we move on to decolonize? I mean, something that to me was very um, meaningful was that it, just the term film studies, just there, you are going to find a really British or American films. If you are interested in films from anywhere else, you are not going to a film studies department. You are going to a Latin American studies department or Asian studies or whatever. So just by the very way into which this is classified, uh, where, where you can uh, study it, that, that's already telling you something. So I guess that broadening the curriculum, making it more inclusive, will uh, help with this decolonization, I would say. And it's fascinating, isn't it? Because you just think in, in a sort of environment, again, I can't, I can't speak for, for, for all higher education institutions, but you know, we are running degrees that are essentially pre-written by marketing people, right? I mean, they're the, they're the ones, they look at it first. And, you know, I definitely had a conversation once uh, about taking the word film out. And I was told, no, 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 can't do that. You know, because then, then you're not, you're sort of not sexy enough. You're not, people don't, people don't think that, you know, they don't understand what you're trying to do. And you think, okay, so the, the whole, the whole structure exactly as you say, Armida, about, you know, a film studies department, all those structures. Uh, well, we've got a lot to undo, haven't we? <laughs> yes. um, I wonder if I'll open it up to our uh, lovely uh, attendees uh, and see if there's any questions from them. I get the, I get the fairly, uh, fairly confident sense the, uh, that the five of us could talk at length. So, uh, yeah, are there any questions from the floor? Um, again, I think you can pop it in the chat. Somebody raised their hand, it seems. Yes, it does seem that way. Uh, I don't know. Um... Mm 
uh, yeah, there is a there is a raised hand there. Uh, Kitty, that might be uh, an accident. Uh, so uh, don't worry about that. Um, good. OK, so uh, we'll we'll keep the floor open. So by all means, uh, do do pop some uh, some questions in there. Uh, uh, if you have any as you come along, uh, I think I'm interested in coil as a method. Uh, I mean, I, I'm hooked on this pirate ship analogy, uh, which I can't quite get out of my head because it it feels a bit more radical. And you guys mentioned documentaries as a potential, you know, this is what we would perhaps focus on and that we would do that because they are, they lend themselves more to an activist kind of model. Uh, and again, we might problematize that. Uh, but did you have, uh, have you have you tried a coil yet? Or are these sort of ideas for putting a coil together? Lina, do you want to answer that? Sure, yeah. I mean, we've explored COIL kind of with various disciplines working across disciplines. So for example, we had um, a Latin American studies, you know, um, class working with a psychology class in Mexico. Um, for example, an architecture class in, I think it was in, an Eastern European country working with dental students in another country um, where the architecture students were, you know, designing um, spaces for dentists. Um, so, you know, it, it really fosters work across cultures and across disciplines. Um, oh, you've muted there. Oh, I'm sorry. So, yeah, I, I, I really like the pirate ship analysis as well, because you're kind of going against the grain to what, um, I guess, you know, like, you know, academics are, for, are afraid of it first. They're kind of like, okay, how does this fit into the curriculum, you know, that's already been set out, that's all, already been agreed. And, you know, we'd have to get permissions from a whole lot of different levels within our institutions. What I have found is that on the Latin American side, they're much, they're much more adaptable um, probably cultural to, to embracing this. Um, thanks to our great partner, um, Universidad Veracruzana in Mexico, who are really one of the pioneers globally in, in this COIL methodology. I mean, they, during the pandemic, they actually rolled out free training for anyone in the world who wanted it. So if anybody's interested, I could share in the link every once a year, they, they invite people from, from, you know, academics from anywhere in the world who'd like to sign up to a full semester training at no cost. And the idea is that you will agree to work with one of their academics and actually, you know, they, they'll handhold you through the process of learning how to do it and actually implementing it in the next semester. So you just have to kind of think of one, um, one subject or one module that you will be giving the next semester and, you know, they'll, they'll work through with you. I mean, to date, Veracruzana have, have done this with 30 universities worldwide, and there's over 2,000 students at their institution who have benefited from it. So for large... Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say that they also have the UVI, the Universidad Veracruzana Intercultural, yeah. which is indigenous uh, people, indigenous students. And uh, they would be a, an ideal partner, actually, for what we were saying. Sorry, Clina, to interrupt. Please go on. Yeah, no, but it, I mean, it's for for a large public institution in in Latin America, like Veracruzana or like UNESPI, the, the state university in Sao Paulo in Brazil. Um, for example, Veracruzana have 70,000 students on campus, on their, on their various campus. A lot of them are actually in, you know, um, predominantly indigenous areas in very rural settings. Um, so of those 70,000 students, you know, they might be able to get 70 students to do physical mobility abroad. So it's not even 1%. So this is why COIL is so important, because it's really internationalizing, giving them an international experience within their, you know, at home. It's internationalization at home. Um, so they really embrace it, students and academics. Um, last year, I had a great experience actually with two of the Veracruzana um, indigenous students. They call it the intercultural Uve. Um, 
So we were working together on, it was an extracurricular activity um, where I had a team of four students, two from Veracruzana, mm -hmm. who were based in um, the mountains in Veracruz, and two students um, from University College Cork. One was actually in Cork, the other girl was in Lima in Peru. Um, and they were working on a social entrepreneur competition over a semester. So they, they met together with a larger group from, there were students from um, throughout Latin America, Spain and Portugal, um, taking training online on how to build a social entrepreneurship project um, based on two of the SDGs. Um, and then they had to meet themselves twice weekly to kind of research together, divide tasks, and actually come up with a research project and present. Um, so it was really enriching. They were looking at the topic they chose was um, how can we, you know, address discrimination within our higher education institutions in Latin America towards indigenous students. So three of the team were actually indigenous um, from indigenous communities, the two girls in Veracruz and the girl in Peru. Um, and it was just such an enriching experience because they were looking at urban settings in, in Peru. They were looking at rural settings in Mexico and kind of addressing and coming up with you know, novel ideas together. Um, the the Irish student Molly who was involved said you know it wasn't only just you know a complete cultural enrichment but also her language was you know improved greatly and they've actually now gone and they're and they're um, publishing a paper together just last Sunday like way beyond what was expected this was a year ago and they're now actually the four of them together are writing a paper so so yeah and although an example. Uh -huh. it, it was not exactly on film studies, but uh, film was an important part of that project that Lina just mentioned, because the way that they, um, that they proved what they had learned was by making a video. So they had to have some training also on that, at least that part. So it was uh, connected. But we haven't as yet found a partner for, a, for this curriculum that we are proposing, which is um, a pity, really. We continue look, uh, looking and trying, and uh, we hope that soon we will be able to implement this. Uh, we've had questions after the paper was published. So we've had interest and people have come back to us. So thanks for that. It's been really great publishing this, this article. Yes, I think the special issue is really good. And congratulations, by the way, to our colleagues here, because um, it's, um, it certainly widened um, uh, now, now a lot more. Uh, well, yeah, uh, people are, are becoming interested and getting back to us with questions on this. So we hope that by next year, we will have, uh, we will have finally had the opportunity to implement it and have some feedback. Uh, perhaps some criticism as well on how to improve it, but they are ideas about what could be done, and um, and they they are very feasible actually. That sounds incredible. Uh, the the link that you mentioned, you know, if you want to pop that in the chat, uh, I I for one would absolutely do some training to uh, bring online one of these. Uh, that sounds uh, that sounds super cool. Um, uh, and I wonder, yeah, I, I wonder, uh, Sarah, in, in your paper, you mentioned th this idea that, that uh, which, you, you know, you, you referenced the Zapatistas and this idea of imagining different worlds and that filmmakers are kind of involved in that in that space or should be involved in that space. I suppose there's probably a bit of a debate and some tension there. But do you then look at the sort of work that Ronnie's doing? Like from an animal's point of view, or point, or or, or you know, with, with students, uh, and do you, do you feel that that might be, you know, an example of something when we're sort of imagining different worlds? Or yeah, I just wanted to go back to a point that you raised earlier about language and film and stuff. I mean, for me, it's not about changing. It's for me, it's about reclaiming film as not being exclusive to uh, Euro Western centrism, but uh, reclaiming film as being, I mean, the, the most culture, the biggest part of the world is in the so called third world and it produces the most culture and films in the world. So, why, 
Like there's these entire continents we don't look at or study of film. So for me, it's about reclaiming that film studies, you know, needs to actually uh, change its focus <laughs> or de, you know, decolonize itself that way. And that these other films that these, you know, um, different people in all these different places in the world are making uh, need to be studied and valued as film. And there's all these other kind of canons that we are completely, uh, that we don't look at. So um, yeah, like I did my uh, doctoral research on an archive of um, indigenous films in Brazil uh, called Vigia nas Aldeias. Um, and, you know, for I was, so much of that work has been talked about as like ethnography or in an anthropological context. And I kind of make an argument to say, uh, no, um, you know, this actually, to decolonize film studies, we actually have to understand um, indigenous film practices as critical and crucial to, you know, understanding. They've been there since the beginning, often as, you know, the object on the other side of the camera. Um, uh, but, you know, they've reclaimed those tools and are, are uh, you know, making films um, and teaching us about the world and look to, you know, what was interesting for me is that a lot of those filmmakers were appropriating the camera as a kind, you know, as just another, as part of their indigenous entity and embodying it. And then, you know, the camera just, it, it becomes uh, a way to understand the world, you know, the, and the non-human world and the more than human world, um, you know, which maybe connects to uh, some of the way that uh, Ronnie was talking about, um, about that uh but you know again as and and the way that they film and meditate on certain you know spaces like we have to kind of decolonize how we analyze those films so that we can kind of access these other universes um yeah that's yeah, a really so. good way of, no it's a really good way of looking at it because yeah, the, the the work is being done it's the being, work is being done we're just not studying it or talking about it or teaching it yeah. Um, I remember that I had a PhD uh, proposal come through uh, a few months ago that sort of tried to talk about why Ghanaian film wasn't being recognized in the same like internationally and uh, sort of made the assumption in there somewhere that it needed it needed to be more Western. And I was mm. like, no, 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 no. I don't think that's the case. I think we need, you know, flip it. It's not about why, you know, it, it's actually about trying to understand what Ghanaian cinema is and has to offer. Uh, yes. and then we can discuss why we're not watching it or why it Absolutely. never gets, you know, gets Yeah, I feel like there's an obsession with um, production values and I try yeah. to kind of decolonize that too. And, yeah. uh, you know, like there's these other philosophies and knowledges that we're going to miss if we're just going to be obsessed with uh, production values. Yeah, that's and that's absolutely that's huge. Again, I, I teach filmmaking, and that's absolutely massive for us, uh, especially with students' expectations. A sort of fetishization of kit. Uh, again, uh, the, you guys who also teach film practice, you know, at my previous institution, if they weren't shooting their grad film on an Arri Alexa, they thought they'd done something wrong. And I was yeah. like, no, maybe your film doesn't need an Arri Alexa, guys. You know, maybe you should be running and gunning, right? I mean, that's that's how that's what digital was supposed to give us was this ability to be uh, a bit more loose. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, good, I, I'll open, thank you for the uh, links there. Uh, I'm gonna be following those up to get myself uh, coiled. Um, and uh, is there, yeah, are there any other, uh, any other comments or, or, or questions from the floor? I'll open it up again, uh, just as we think about potentially closing, uh, closing the panel. Um, Great. Any other final remarks from our lovely panelists? Thank you so much for your time uh, this afternoon, this evening, wherever in the world you are this morning, Sarah, indeed. Um, but uh, yes, this has been a, a wonderful panel. I've uh, I've made so many notes and learned so much myself. Uh, so I hope that uh, I hope that's been a shared uh, experience uh, for uh, for our attendees as well. Uh, this has been recorded uh, and might be shared. Uh, but you can follow the Film Education Journal on Twitter uh, for, for updates on, uh, on where our materials are as well. Uh, and uh, our, our new issue, uh, of course, which goes live uh, this week, I believe. Uh, and Ronnie's full article uh, will be in there. Uh, link, again, I think, was popped in the chat. 
Uh, so I'll give a few minutes for people to type comments. And other than that, thank you very much from me and the team at the Film Education Journal. And thank you again to all our wonderful panellists for giving up your time this afternoon. Uh, you've taught me so much. So thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Have a lovely <laughs> evening or day, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.